Good afternoon, everybody. This is DJ McClanahan coming to you once again from WACT Radio. I have with me on this program today casting director Mike Fenton. Very experienced casting director that we have here, so it would be beneficial to all of you actors out there to listen very carefully to what Mr. Fenton has to say. But anyway, I'm glad you're here, Mike. How you doing? I'm doing all right, DJ. Got a little bit of jet lag, but uh, I'm hanging in there. All right, well, as I usually ask the casting directors when they're in here, why don't you start off by telling us how you got into casting? By default. I was uh, a UCLA majoring in motion pictures. In those days, theater arts was divided into theater and motion pictures, and I think there were 16 of us in the motion picture division. I graduated as a cinematographer and couldn't get a job. And in 1956, if you didn't know or have an end to a union and you were a below-the-line tradesperson, you had no chance. Then I went to law school for a year, hated it, then went into the service for six months because the Army was chasing me. When I got out of the Army, I was hired into the mailroom of MCA on October 5, 1958. And then around the end of May in 1959, I became an agent, and I worked with Herman Citron, who was one of Lou Wasserman's right-hand men. So I had a great introduction to the business, and I was trained very well. <laughs> yeah, i definitely say you did have a lot of training. So uh, what happened once you uh, became an agent at MCA? Went from mailroom to uh, being an agent. What, uh, what happened after that? Uh, all the time I was an agent at MCA, and then later at Ashley Steiner, I kept getting offers from Paramount to come to work as a casting director. And a casting director is just the flip side of being an agent. The difference between a casting director and an agent is that an agent is responsible for his or her own 40 or 50 clients, plus all the clients in the agency. Now, a, uh, a big agency like MCA or uh, a Today, a creative artist represents maybe a thousand, maybe twelve hundred acting clients. The senior agents probably have about twenty-five or thirty clients on their list. And it would be the same at William Morris or at ICM. And the casting director is responsible for knowing eight or ten thousand actors, maybe more. So uh, I went under contract with Paramount in 1963 as a casting director, and I was there until 1965. I cast Hal Willis's movies and. Uh, Jerry Lewis movies, and Elvis Presley movies, a whole bunch of films that are totally forgotten in my resume, and in everybody else's history of the business. Uh, we didn't get credit in those days. This was about the time that Lynn Stallmaster was an independent. And if a director wanted to use Lynn, he would say to the director, I'm not going to do your movie unless you give me billing on the main title. Now, Fred Ruse and I started our company in 1971 and we pulled the same shenanigans. As soon as we got a couple of good clients, such as Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas, we said, uh, we're not going to do your movies unless you give us billing in the main title. And they said, what do we care about your billing? You can have whatever you want. So as soon as we made the breakthrough, everybody got on the bandwagon. It was a tremendous battle for all the casting directors at Warner Brothers and Paramount. Uh, for whatever reason, those two places never wanted us to have billing. So Fred and I were together, and then Jane Feinberg joined us, and then Fred got the opportunity to produce the conversation, and he bowed out, and we changed the name of the company to Fenton Feinberg, and uh, then uh, Jane and I had the company together for about, oh, 15 years. Judy Taylor came to work with us as our secretary about two years after we started Fenton Feinberg, and then Jane decided she wanted to retire in February of 1988. So, Judy and I have had the company since then. All right, well, it's very interesting that you were an agent prior to becoming a casting director. That's not always the case with uh, casting directors that I've interviewed. So, uh, what about that? Uh, since, since you were an agent yourself, what advice would you offer to actors about finding an agent? Or uh, about making the most of their relationship with their agent if they already have one? Well, I'd like to say that you have three bullets in your arsenal as an actor. Your three bullets for your weapon are, first and foremost, your agent. It's probably the most important bullet that you have. And I'll come back to how you get one and all that. The second is your picture and resume. And the third is your video reel. Now, if you have to get along without one of those elements, you should manage without the video reel. If you have to get along without two of them, you probably have to get along without an agent. Because if you don't have a picture and a resume, you haven't even started yet. 
So what you really have to do is find somebody who will take a photograph of you. A black and white photograph taken outdoors under natural light. Doesn't get airbrushed. Doesn't get touched up. It's just you. And that's true specifically for women, because if your agent submits your photograph for a part because the breakdown services have came out, and you're now 36 years old and you weigh 122 pounds, which is fine for your height, but your agent submits a photograph of you when you were 17 weighing 96 pounds, and you walk in, well, there's going to be hell to pay. You really have to have a recent photograph. And men, if you have a beard and you shave it off, or if you grow a mustache, you need a picture of what you look like today. All right, well, now this is, uh, this is the format for Los Angeles. I know there's a, a different way of doing it if you're in New York City, which is based predominantly on stage work. Uh, so what I'm giving here is the uh, format um, that uh, stands for the Los Angeles market. Uh, first of all, the format of the resume starts out with your name. It's in the upper left corner. Then in the upper right corner, you list your height, you list your eye color and your hair color. You don't have to list your weight because it may fluctuate. And then in the middle of your resume, your union affiliation should appear. Uh, you might be uh, AF of M, or you might be AGVA, but that doesn't go on an acting resume. If you're Actors' Equity Association, if you're SAG, if you're AFTRA, uh, if you're any uh, part of the Canadian Union, the ACTRA, well, uh, that might go on your resume. We cast films in Canada, and if you live in Los Angeles and we know of you as an actor in our area, We'd be much happier to hire you than ship you to Canada if you're ACTRA than we would be to go up there and find a Canadian. Uh, and the first heading on your resume should be for film. And again, this is for LA, standard procedure here. And that means motion picture film. If you've never done a motion picture film, you can list film and just put a call in there. It shows you at least know the format and someday you're going to do a motion picture, we hope, if you stay in the business long enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, sometimes you got to inject a little humor, DJ. All right, the next category is television, and the television category encompasses network, syndicated, or first-run syndicated. It's not cable in this particular area. And then the category after that is theater. And theater is all the theater work you've done, uh, wherever you've done it. Now, for a lot of you out there, your resume will be primarily made up of theater. If you have a lot of theater, then you have to be discerning about what you list there. If you wish to list only plays you've starred in, well then list the plays you've starred in. Uh, other film would be the next category. That's a very important one. It includes university film, industrials, AFI film, and cable television. This is all those areas where you probably had a real chance to strut your stuff, but it's not quite mainstream the way the film and television categories are. After other film, you can take your choice. You might put uh, commercials, list upon request. Uh, you may never do a commercial in your entire life, but at least you know the format. And then you can list special skills and abilities, which is all the things you can do and all the things you're licensed to do. And that means licensed as a scuba diver or licensed as a skydiver or licensed as a pilot. All right, you should be current in these areas. Because if you once went skydiving seven years ago, and someone is doing a television movie about skydiving, and you go up for it, and it says skydiving on your resume, and the casting director says, yeah, we'll take you. And then the director reads you and loves you, and you get a part, and they take you up and throw you out of an airplane, well, it could be a problem for you. So yeah, it's very important. Make sure you're current at whatever you say you're licensed to do. Under special skills and abilities, uh, you're also going to list any languages that you speak. And that's real skill in speaking a language, not a language that you studied for six months in high school uh, 20 years ago. It means that you're fluent in the language. And if you say that you play baseball, well, you don't have to play at the semi-pro level, but you sure as hell better be able to hit the ball if someone pitches it to you. So again, in putting your resume together, use your head, because if you prevaricate on your resume, it can come back and bite you in the bottom. And if it does, it leaves teeth marks. And then uh, either in that heading or the next heading is education. And the only reason for that is that I, well, I like to know where you went to school. I like to know what you studied, what degrees you have, who your acting teachers were, and if you're studying currently, and if you're in a workshop. Those things are of interest to me because they show professionality. A lot of casting directors couldn't care less, but uh, I, f I find this uh, category very important. Now, I mentioned before, DJ, that uh, film is a director's medium. 
And in terms of your resume, you can leave the producer's name off, you can leave the distributor's name off, you can leave the name of the movie off, but put the director's name on it. Now, in a blind submission, let's say that your agent sends your resume in for a picture that Dick Donner is directing. Now, Dick Donner's memory is not as long as mine, which isn't very long. But if I get a picture and a resume that says you worked for Dick Donner eight years ago, I'd be a fool not to go to Dick Donner and say, look, here's Joan Smith. You used her eight years ago. She looks perfect for this role. Let's get her in here. So, hopefully you get the point. Everybody listening out there, list the director's name. Very, very important. Yeah, so I hope everybody heard that. Hope you're paying attention. List the director's name for the film. Now, what about television and theater? Should you do that for uh, television and theater, too? Yeah, you do it for film, television, and theater. Television directors graduate, and they go on to do film. Theater directors graduate, and they go on to do AFI films or whatever. Your uh, AFI directors go on to be motion picture directors and heads of studios. And also... Uh, you got to take the guys at uh, you know UCLA, the guys at USC, the guys at Carnegie Mellon who make film. One year they're a senior in college or a graduate student, and then four years later they're running TriStar. So you got to keep these things in mind. It's very important uh, you know, to remember that who you work with early on can become extraordinarily important uh, in the future. So it's always good to remember your names, remember the people that you work with. Uh, work begets work. And even if you star in a motion picture that's not mainstream, if you star in a motion picture at USC or at UCLA or at AFI and the picture gets great notices, and if John Milius asks you or asks your agent, gee, would he do this terrific three-minute scene in my movie? Well, you better think about it. Because Milius' films, whether they're accepted by the public or not, are seen by the inner circle because Milius is a good filmmaker. Do you by chance have any advice about how actors should conduct themselves in interviews? Interviews happen a lot for actors, and uh, a lot of actors don't like interviews. Robert De Niro, uh, I remember reading him as saying that interviews were something that uh, he, he hated to do. He'd much rather audition, but interviewing is a necessary evil, I guess you might say. So uh, what about any advice about that? Uh, what, how should actors conduct themselves when they do have to go to an interview? Yeah, there's a lot to say about this. I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I would say if you have an interview with anyone who's in a position to hire you, and you've had a psychological trauma, don't go to the interview. Because if you blow the interview, you, you, you may never get in again. We have very, very short memories when we see you do something great. We might remember it for one year, three years, nine years. But if you do something awful, we'll never forget. You should also think about the dollar involvement. Because when you're young, it doesn't make any difference what they pay you. If you're looking for exposure, and money is not the end all. If money is your end all, you're in the wrong business. Yeah, and so it really is better to think from the beginning about building a career rather than just making a living. Sounds like that's what you're saying. Well, I'll tell you. Anytime you need a job, the chances are you won't get it. Now, I don't mean you should come in there and kick back and take off your shoes, you know, and be nonchalant about it. There is a happy medium. But if you're comfortable in the interview process, and you can work yourself up to the point, you know, to that point where you're comfortable, then the chances are that if you're in there and you're right for the part, then you're going to get a fair shake. And I will tell you this, directors don't interview six people and then turn to us and say, yeah, those, those four were just horrible. I couldn't stand them. And the one with the orange hair, oh, yuck. Oh, oh, but I'm going to take her. No, it, it doesn't happen that way. It usually comes down to making a decision between two people, or among three people. And that decision is based on a lot of variables, not the least of which is the hair color of the star of the film. If she's blonde, and you're blonde, and there are only two women in the film, well, guess what? The chances are that you will not get the part, and the brunette who read against you will get the part. Is there much difference between the readings? Well, probably not. Is the one so much a better actress? Probably not. Hair color, chemistry, how do you look with the lead in the film? How do you look with the male lead in the film? How do you look with the person you're playing the role with in the particular scene you're doing? These are things that casting directors take into consideration, and it can make the difference uh, between whether you get the part or you don't. All right, let me ask you this. Are you aware of a big difference between the casting scene in New York and that in Los Angeles from an actor's point of view? Well, one thing that happens in New York is that most actors come into an interview or a reading totally prepared. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that if you have a reading in California for a motion picture that you'd be off the page, but if you were off the page and still held on to the script, the director could do a lot more with you. So my suggestion is that if you want to be very, very comfortable in a reading with a motion picture director, then you should have your words. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's move on and talk about video reels. What, uh, you, you mentioned that as far as uh, this being an important part of the uh, actor's arsenal, as you put it. So uh, what, what, do you, what do you like to see on an actor's uh, video reel? Well, with any luck, your video reel will have some work on it. <laughs> I mean, right? Uh, that would be a body of work that you're pleased with. But when you're very young or when you're just starting out in the business, you're not going to have a test with Dustin Hoffman and a reading for a pilot at ABC and a movie of the week opposite Victoria Principal. We're reasonable people. We understand that. So, your first video reel, if you're lucky, may have one 30-second commercial on it. But it's a place to start. I work very often for a man named Steven Spielberg. Maybe you're familiar with him, all of you listening out there. Maybe you're familiar with him too, DJ, huh? Well, let me tell you something. Something that maybe you don't know about Steven Spielberg. When he's in the editing room, what does he watch during the daytime? You may never guess. He watches soap operas. He loves them. While he's cutting a film, that's what he's doing. I'm telling you, I'll probably get no fewer than two calls a week to find out who's on this soap opera or that soap opera, uh, who, who's the girl in the Pepsi commercial, who's the guy in the hang gliding commercial. Steven Spielberg looks at commercials and soap operas, and uh, so do many other directors. Commercials give you great exposure, so that's an important thing to remember. So what should go on your video reel? Well, one thing I can tell you not to do, don't spend six or seven hundred dollars and go down to the corner production house and do a soliloquy from Hamlet or um, Hello out there because it's not professional and it looks crummy. The video reel is your calling card and obviously you want it to be as good as it can possibly be. If you don't have anything to put on a video reel, then don't put anything on the video reel. All right, we don't want to see you doing Hamlet. All right, remember that. Now, how do you get stuff for your video reel? All right, well, good question. First, uh, say you get a job. Let's say you go up for a movie at AFI, and they say, we love you, we're going to use you, but we're not going to pay you. So you cleverly go to the director, or if you're really clever, you go quickly to the editor, and you say, hey, I'm not getting paid for the job, but I will pay you to get a composite of my scenes. And the editor then says, ah, don't worry, I'll take care of it. But you got to do it before you shoot the scene. All right, go to the editor, and if you can't find out who's going to cut it, go to the director and say, look, I'm doing you a favor. I'm doing this for nothing. I've got a two-and-a-half-minute scene. I want the film uh, from that, or I, I want a video reel copy of it, because if I'm going to give you my time and my energy, I want to be repaid. Now, there isn't a director or an editor on the face of the earth who will say, no, I'm not going to do that for you. I mean, if there is, they're rare, all right? The same goes if you do L.A. Law. If you have a scene that matters, all right, that's what I'm talking about. I don't mean a scene in which you open the door and someone hands you a flower and you say thank you. You, you have to look at this realistically. Uh, even if, even if you're, you're just starting, you've you got to have a scene that's got something in it, something that's going to uh, give the viewer something to study, something to look at, something that shows your ability to handle dialogue and what you look like on film at that moment. All right, now, how about the order of what you put on it? Now, I can't tell you the best order, uh, but if you have a body of work, look at it. Look at it with a friend who's an editor, a friend who's a director, a friend who's a writer, a friend who's a cinematographer, a friend who's uh, a still cameraman. Uh, you have a wife, you have a mother, you have a father, you have a husband, you have somebody that can look at it. All right, Sit down with that individual and say, look, here are my scenes. You write them down on a sheet of paper and you say, here's a scene where I laugh, here's a scene where I cry, or, or whatever. Figure out an order that makes sense. If you want to gussy it up, have someone make little titles for you. you know, use the main title from a show that you did so, so that it says L.A. Law featuring Joan Smith. At least they know who they're looking at. And if you're clever, and if the director is somebody who really matters, put L.A. Law directed by so-and-so and featuring Joan Smith. It's a director's medium, all right? Remember that. A director looking at that piece of videotape says, Aha! This person appreciates directors. And since directors are our lifeblood, they're very important to you as an actor. All right, now here we go. Important issue here, the issue of getting an agent, especially in L.A. This is of utmost importance, of course. And uh, you mentioned early on you were going to tell us how to do that, so let's talk about that. How should the actor go about finding the right agent? Well, 
An approach to getting an agent is to go to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Library, and then you get the Academy Player's Directory, either the male or the female volume. You sit down, you open it to where the pictures are. Every time you see and recognize a face, write down who the agent is. You'll have a legal pad and you'll end up with about 30 agencies. And those 30 agencies will have most of the tick marks next to them because the people you recognize are going to be working actors. And then what you're going to do, you're going to look at that list and you're going to say, well, CAA isn't going to sign me, and APA isn't going to sign me, and William Morris isn't going to sign me. And then you'll look down and you'll see that there are 16 small and medium-sized agencies left. Now the way to get an agent is to talk to actors who work. Submit your picture and resume and submit a video reel. And if you have anything at all on the video reel that sparks their interest, you might get signed. Now women, for all of you, if you walk into an agent's office and the agent is male and is sitting behind a desk and you pull up a chair and sit down and you're there about four minutes and then the agent says, yes, I think, uh, I think we should sign you. And then you, you're going to say, well, let me think about it. I've got to talk to my dad about it. And you get up and leave. If an agent has not seen your work and doesn't know what you can do, how can the agent possibly represent you? And if the agent doesn't know what you're capable of, that agent's not going to sell you for work. And therefore, it's foolish to sign with that agent. So if you don't do a scene for an agent or you don't show the agent your videotape, what do you have to go on? And in this city, agents sign actors. It's not a freelance marketplace. It's not like you have in New York. So if you're signed with an agent here, you're stuck for nine months, unless you don't work. And then if you don't work, you can't get out. It's hard to get an agent whom you trust. It really is. Uh, I, I feel for actors here. It's really hard to get an agent who is a good agent. Now, what is that? A good agent is somebody who's able to get you the proper kind of exposure to the proper kind of people for roles that will build a career. If all an agent wants to do is send you out for day work for the rest of your life, well, that's probably where you are. We use a wonderful agency in the Valley called Feature Players, which represents day players. They represent all the faces that you see. Uh, you know, everybody on their roster has probably done a minimum of uh, 50, I'd say, yeah, 50 films. And they're all just regular looking people who've had enormous amounts of training and study, and they study all the time in workshops, and they work constantly. And why do they work constantly? because they've created a niche in the marketplace and they're very satisfied working three days a month, four days a month, and they're getting, what, six or eight hundred dollars a day. And the, but they're happy with that. They have another job. They might sell real estate or cars or whatever, and, and they're very happy doing that. They're actors. They get their health insurance paid for, which is no mean task today, and they're enjoying themselves. But they don't kid themselves. They, they know that when they're with feature players, that's where they're going to be. And whenever we're stuck, when we get that horrible phone call at 4.30 in the afternoon from someone saying, uh, we just wrote this new part, we need somebody, we need a day player who will do it for $600, well, that's when we call feature players. So feature players can be very good, but you have to, you have to keep in mind it does have its limitations and you can only go so far with it. Well, just out of curiosity, because uh, you've, in, in a movie like E.T., for example, you had to do some casting of kids. And uh, I've heard some casting directors talk about how much of a problem that can be, how much of a challenge that is. So can you say a few words about that? Like, what, what are some of the problems related to casting kids in movies? How, how do you, I mean, for example, how, how did you find Elliot in E.T.? <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, let me tell you how we found little Elliot, because it's kind of a clue about the difference between Steven Spielberg and me. We were looking desperately for someone to play Elliot. And uh, Kathy Kennedy had seen some footage on a film called Raggedy Man, and Henry Thomas had been in Raggedy Man. And Kathy said, you should, you, you guys, you, you gotta see this guy. So we trooped into the projection room and uh, looked at the film and Stephen said, yeah, he's, he's terrific, get him here. So he flew all morning from Texas and with the time change, he got up at four o'clock in the morning and got to MGM and had lunch. I met with him after lunch and I gave him a scene. And for Stephen's movies, we don't use a scene from the movie. Stephen has a scene written to test people with. So I gave Henry the scene, and he looked at it, and I ran the scene with him. And I directed him in the scene. I acted in the scene with him. And nothing was happening. The scene just sat there. And I'm thinking to myself, well, this kid has been up all day. He's traveled all the way here, but th this isn't going to work. This, this scene is, is uh, it's deadly. So I called Stephen down, and Stephen looked at the scene and said, yeah, you're right. And he said, uh, tell you what, Henry go into the video room. 
So Henry goes into the room, and Stephen turns to me and says, Look, get off the page. And when the page ends, I want you to go for his throat. I mean, just go for the jugular. You just stay right after him. Barrel in, and I want you to say this to him. Say, tell him that you're going to take E.T. away from him. All right, so we start the camera, and I do the scene, and uh, the, the scene's just going nowhere again. Henry's energy is just nil. I get to the end of the page, and Henry puts the page down. I turn to him, and I look him in the eye, and I say, I'm taking the E.T. And Henry looks at me, and he, sa he says, what? And I told him, I said, hey, I'm taking the E.T. away from you. I represent the United States government. The government is bigger than you are, and we're going to experiment on the E.T., and Henry looks at me and he says, you, you can't do that. He's my friend. And he starts to cry. And Stephen, standing right next to the camera, says, Henry, Henry, it's okay. You got the job. Cut. So just an interesting little story there, how these things can work. Now, when we did the Bad News Bears, it was, uh, it was like madness. Uh, with, with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, it took weeks to get those kids. It's very difficult to cast children. But again, it's like casting adults. You work with somebody long enough, something comes through. Or nothing comes through. Sometimes it is just the luck of the draw. Wow, what a great story. I gotta tell you, I love that. I tell you, Mike, I could do this all day, but unfortunately we are reaching the point where we gotta wrap it up. All right, DJ. Well, it's been a pleasure being here. Oh, hey, uh, yeah, maybe we can, I don't know, go out and have a beer sometime, huh? I, I don't know. I'm uh, kind of busy, DJ. Well, I, I know you are, but, but before you go, uh, if I could... So, I don't know, take a moment just to ask, uh, I mean, could you see me as a, a starring, uh, kind of a, you know, leading guy, leading man? Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, another, uh, another Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt? Not really. Okay, folks, we are out of time. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time on The Acting Show.